Good morning, campers. Good morning. Such a privilege to be with you here today, this morning. I'm Norman Tregenza. I've been with Camp Constitution since its inception and a friend of Mr. Shirtliff for many, many, many years. And we are going to talk today about a document which is like a thunderbolt of lightning. The Declaration of Independence. As, as Pastor Whitney referred to it in the previous class, um, it is our Amer America's birth certificate. Okay. You can see John Hancock's signature, uh, top and center. <clears throat> when someone says, put your John Hancock on something, that's where the expression came from. It came from America's birth certificate. But how did this document come about? People had lived in North America for many, many years, uh, about 150 years, Europeans had come and lived in North America. Um, but it really wasn't until the 1760s and the 1770s that there were tensions between the European country and North America, okay? Uh, what happened was <clears throat> British Parliament imposed a series of taxes on the American colonies. The colonies had no representation in the British Parliament, so therefore they had no vote. Um, and when some of the British came to disarm uh, some Americans in one particular town, Lexington, Massachusetts. Hostilities erupted one day, and there was never, never a way to reconcile the two parties. Uh, just, just prior to that, the Continental Congress had been formed uh, in the American colonies, and that was in 1774. There were 13 colonies, and all 13 were represented in the Continental Congress. Finally, the, the Continental Congress established a committee to draft a document declaring independence from the mother country. This committee was called the Committee of Five. Say Committee of Five. Committee Great. of Five. Great, okay. How many people do you think were on that committee? Five. If you said five, you're right. Okay. <clears throat> so, on the Committee of Five we had, uh, and you can say each name with me, John Adams, John. Benjamin, Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Robert Livingston, Robert Livingston and Roger Sherman of Connecticut. It was, it was said to John Adams, Mr. Adams, you should write the Declaration of Independence. And John Adams said, no, nope, hold on a second. We have a man with such a great, brilliant mind. I'm going to ask him to write the Declaration of Independence. And so John Adams said to Thomas Jefferson, he said, Mr. Jefferson, will you write this declaration? And Jefferson agreed to do it. Jefferson was the primary author of the document. His primary consultant as he wrote the document was John Adams. Uh, and then when Jefferson had completed the document, he brought the document to the committee he, um, <clears throat> uh, Ben Franklin was the primary editor of the document, shortened the document by about 20%, uh, did some rearranging and, and, and made some changes, and that, and then, and then of course Livingston and Sherman uh, also uh, reviewed the document, but that is, oh, here's that, oh good, now, now you can see them. 
That is how the document came about. All right. The great Thomas Jefferson of Virginia. Okay. Yes, he was selected. He was 33 years old. He was a great scholar, a Virginian, um, the greatest of writers and thinkers of his era, and he lived in a beautiful home which he himself had, had built called Monticello. So, Jefferson wrote our birth certificate. Where he wrote it was on Market Street in Philadelphia. 700 Market Street, this is the building. It still exists to this day. It's, uh, it's, you can walk from that building to Independence Hall. Uh, and here, here's the document. So let's, let's read it together. And Pastor Whitney um, uh, went through some of these phrases in the previous class. <clears throat> we'll, we'll all say it together. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. So, um, <clears throat> Pastor Whitney referred to the laws of nature. The laws of nature are what, what he described. Basically, b biblical law, unchangeable law. Uh, it's, <clears throat> you, 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 can never, you can never go into your neighbor's house and take something uh, that's his, okay? That's true 10 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, that's an unchangeable law. Changeable law would be like, well, we, we, we want to require a larger fire door uh, on, on the side uh, of a building. That's a changeable law. That's not a law of nature, okay? So this is what they're talking about. He's, he's talking about uh, the laws of nature, and if they're going to change governments, they need to state publicly why they want to do it. The founding fathers were honest. They were open about what they did. Okay? Let's, let's go to this clause here. This is the second sentence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Okay. <clears throat> they are endowed by their creator. Who's their creator? And what are their rights? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as I said earlier, Thomas Jefferson was a great reader and thinker. And he had read, in 1776, um, most, most of what had been written about government up until that time. So what had been written about government in that time was written in the 15 and 16 and 1700s, most of it. Um, and there was a, a gentleman named John Locke who lived in the 1600s. Uh, say John Locke. John Locke. That's spelled L-O-C-K-E. John Locke, okay? I actually know one of his descendants. And um, <clears throat> John Locke had written in one of his uh, treatises uh, a phrase called life, liberty, and property. Say life, liberty, and property. And Thomas Jefferson borrowed that and adjusted it and called it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay. And so <clears throat> he wrote that to secure these rights, governments are instituted amongst men. Okay. This is one of the key phrases in the entire document. D in, entire document. <clears throat> governments are instituted. Why are governments instituted? To to se secure to secure these rights 
Governments are, governments are instituted, governments are created. Governments are created to secure these rights and these rights are, go ahead, say it again. So what's the purpose of government? The purpose of government is to protect your, your life, your liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. This is America 101. Okay. Oops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay. That whenever <clears throat> any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, go ahead. That. Let's all say it, everybody. That. Right of the people to alter or abolish it and institute a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and their happiness. Okay? So, <clears throat> the colonists felt in the 1770s that that the taxes that were imposed upon them and the fact that that the British came after them and wanted to disarm them was destructive um, was destructive of these ends if you will and they decided it, it, to, to use their right to alter or to, to abolish uh, their government and, and so there, we're going to get to the next part, which is Jefferson is going to lay out the reasons why he did this. <clears throat> Prudence, indeed, let's all do it together. Prudence, indeed, will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light or transient causes. He, he's saying this is not something that should be done uh, every day. Okay? And accordingly, and accordingly, all, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Uh, and by the way, that's not a misspelling uh, on shown. Um, that's how it was spelled in the Declaration of Independence. Um, <clears throat> the Declaration was written before standardized dictionaries. So um, there were, uh, there were more than one ways to spell certain words at that time. And this is how Jefferson uh, wrote it. Uh, but what he's saying is that um, as bad as things may be, it's usually better to stay with what you have than to change something. He says, but when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Okay. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies. And such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. That's okay. We'll, I'll, I'll just take this part for, from here and we'll come back to, to everyone um, later on. <clears throat> the, the history of the present king of Great Britain, and Pastor Whitney referred to him, uh, who, was the, who was the king of Great Britain? It was... King George, King George III, actually, uh, is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. What are the states that they're talking about? They're talking about the, the yeah, 
13 colonies. Yep. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Okay? And we kept that clause at the top uh, under each statement, which is one of those facts. Okay? He has refused assent to his laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. So the king wasn't even obeying his own law. Okay? Um, <clears throat> he has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so sus suspended, he has utterly neglected to attend uh, to them. So this is a serious problem when you have a, a, a ruler 3,000 miles away, okay, and something needs to be addressed, okay, and to get a document onto a vessel, uh, I, can, I can only imagine it took a couple of weeks to cross the ocean, uh, and then and then longer once they get to England to get to London, okay, uh, and then for Parliament to to deal with it. So we're talking about long periods of time where uh, Americans are are not having their concerns addressed. Which doesn't lead to trust. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the expository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the rights of the people. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and the payment of their salaries. It's hard to have an honest and objective judge uh, when the judge is being paid for by the king. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Does that sound like what's going on in America today? I mean, there's, there's officers and uh, government employees everywhere to, to tell us what to do and require paperwork. Well, it's not even paperwork anymore. I guess it's ha most of it's done on the computer, which is even harder. Okay. <clears throat> he has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us. Um, and it's different today. We assume that there's an army in America today. But back in the 1700s, armies only existed during wartime. When the war was over, uh, everyone went home and back to work. So, so the, exi the existence of an army at that time implied, um, implied, implied war, really. Or they, or they were ready for war. For cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. He, he has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of, of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. Wow. Okay, so <clears throat> what, what the king and what England were doing is they were hiring 
people from, from other countries in Europe to come over here and, and basically kill us if we didn't comply. Um, has, did, did, has anybody uh, familiar with the Battle of Trenton? Raise your hand if you're familiar with the Battle of Trenton. Okay, a few of you, good, okay. Uh, most of those soldiers that were fighting for Britain were from Germany. Um, and m miraculously, uh, the Americans uh, won those battles um, and, and with very few casualties. It was, it was really a miracle. And uh, also, complete is spelled correctly. It's, um, that's the way Jefferson spelled it. In, <clears throat> in every stage of these oppressions, actually, let's all read this together. <clears throat> In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. And this, this campers, is, is, um, is what I call the lightning bolt. Um, you know, every, every 100 years, the, the most meaningful sentence is written, the most powerful sentence uh, for, any, for any particular century. And this is, this is probably the most powerful sentence right here. Um, <clears throat> let's read it together. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America, in general Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Boom! That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connections with them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> this had to have been an incredible shock to uh, King George and to Parliament uh, when, they, when they read this. No country had ever been created like this before. Let's keep going here. And that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. Okay, okay. And that word they, meaning, meaning each state. So Maryland, Virginia, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. Here we go. And for support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, who has heard that before? Okay. This is something that every student should know in America. Uh, this, this is America's birth certificate, the key phrases. Um, let, let's... <clears throat> Let's say it again. I'll, I'll read the first part and then tell you when to chime in. And for support of this, this, this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, here we go. 
we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Okay. So, the Declaration of Independence had 56 signers. Okay. Is it, yeah, it's up there. Good. The, fo the photos are, are, are up now. Um, <clears throat> here is a, uh, a portrait of, of many of them. Uh, Jefferson is, is the one, he's the kind of the tallest one in the center, okay, uh, with red hair. Uh, ben Franklin is to his right. Um, yeah. John Hancock is the one sitting at the desk uh, in the red chair with, with the wig. Okay. Uh, and this all took place at, at Independence Hall in Philadelphia. Okay. <clears throat> the signers signed in order of state. Okay. So th there's only a couple of signers that, have out, that are out of order. John Hancock is, is separate from the Massachusetts uh, signers. The reason for that is because he was the president of the Continental Congress at that time. Now, <clears throat> the title of president is not equivalent to what we have today uh, with a president of the United States, okay? The president at that time, oh, goodness. Saying my battery's getting low here. Um, the 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 president. I wonder if this is on. Is this is this giving juice? I hope so. All right. Well, we'll just go without it. Um, <clears throat> the title of of uh, <clears throat> the. The president of the Continental Congress, because there was no executive branch of the government, uh, it was just one le legislature, and it was just one chamber of one legislature, really. Uh, the closest thing like that today would be the Speaker of the House. That's, that's, that's closer in terms of the powers of John Hancock that he had at that time. Uh, but we're going to lose this, I think, pretty quickly here, so I'm going to try to hurry it up. But you'll see John Hancock's signature here. Uh, underneath him are the, um, are the Maryland signers, okay? Uh, they signed by state. Uh, all the way to the right are the New Hampshire signers, but Matthew Thornton is not with the other New Hampshire signers. Does anybody know why? Some people have said, well, he had to go to the bathroom. Okay. No, that's not true. Uh, no one knows. No one knows. And he's the only one who's not with the rest uh, of the signers of, of his state. And this is not even working now. Well, uh, are there questions? Yeah. When did they sign the declaration? They it was it was written from about uh, like eleventh of June to the twenty seventh or eighth of June, somewhere in that period. And then I actually think it was signed on July second. Uh, yeah, but and it, because John Adams at one point he said, "May July second ever be known." Uh, as the great day, and may there be fireworks, which which is pretty remarkable to to think of. I, I cannot imagine what what fireworks were like back in the 1770s, uh, but they must add something. Uh, obviously, not what what we have today. Uh, but he quoted the day July 2nd, but I think it was later presented uh, on the fourth. Yeah. Did you have a question? Yeah. What's your favorite part of the declaration? Oh. <laughs> Well, there are a lot of them. There, there are a lot of them. But, um, I mean, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And um, we are endowed by our Creator uh, with certain inalienable rights. Uh, among these rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, 
Every, everyone should know that phrase. Let's say it together. We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And uh, Mr. Shirtliff, I think, I think, he, did he give you one of these? Did everyone get one? Wow, what a great gift this is. And the great thing about it is that all the spelling and punctuation, meaning commas and spacing and uh, everything is exactly the way Thomas Jefferson wrote it. There are score, you know, scores of versions of the Declaration of Independence out there and they change things. They say, well, he, he meant this, so we'll change, you know. Uh, but no, this is, this is the original version. Stick with this and, uh, and, and, and read it and study it. Are there any other questions? Yes? Who is your favorite founding father and what's your favorite quote from them? Oh, uh, you know, my favorite founding father changes all the time. But I'll tell you, Mr. Shirtliff's f favorite founding father for about 30 years at least has been John Adams. Mr. Shirtliff loves John Adams. And John Adams doesn't get the credit, really, that he should because he's the one who chose George Washington or nominated, he nominated George Washington to become the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. And, and the war would not have been successful if Washington hadn't been uh, uh, appointed. And he's the one who chose Jefferson or nominated Jefferson to write the Declaration of Independence. So even though Adams didn't have necessarily the talent to do certain things, he had the great ability to see, oh, this person has that skill. We must have that person uh, in, in such a role. Um, but, you know, yeah. It, yeah. I believe they actually voted on it by voice on the second. So it legally was ratified then, but then they still waited until the fourth to uh, actually sign. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, yep. I'm, I'm yep. curious too. Um, do we have the original somewhere? Where, um, that there, there are four original copies. There, there are four original copies. One of them is down in Washington, in um, is it the um, is it the Smithsonian? Oh, C Congress, Archives of Congress, National National Archives, uh, National Archives. No Norman Lear. Uh, who is the creator of All in the Family, the TV show, 50 years ago, actually bought one because he's a billionaire. Uh, so I know Norman Lear has one. National Archives have, has one. There, there's, I think there's one in, in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And then there's one other. So there's, there's four, four original copies that, that, that I'm aware of. Yep. Um, did, yep. Do we have the original version that... Thomas Jefferson wrote first before they was uh, edited in the group. Um, yeah, if <clears throat> there there are there are earlier versions, and you can see Benjamin Franklin uh, cross out words and and redo. For example, uh, Jefferson's original word was "We hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable that all men are created equal." And Franklin uh, edited, edited that and made it self-evident.